what is the real human 2.0 because there are a lot of people that believe in ufology and various things such as ascension and a lot of these people believe that earth is heading into a time when we will enter into this fifth dimension or higher vibration we have to understand what's happening here yes we are headed for something better but what are the real parameters of it and is there any way to tell is there any comparison or measure that we can make now by which we can truly know what is coming so now know that I say and God's Word says that there is a real advancement in the human condition itself coming notice that out of all religions or sources claiming to be divine information they do not contain anything about eternal life or promising eternal life there is only one that is offering this notice I am not saying that other religions have false claims of eternal life I am saying they have no claims of eternal life I find it amazing how a lot of people spend all this time and money trying to extend their lives and for instance my parents were heavy new agers and they were constantly into the whole thing of life extension and yet there was a solution to the problem of growing old and dying right there in the Bible now just that one thing out of the Bible that is eternal life is so profound that it's a wonder why it isn't the center of discussion of New Agers or people that are seeking to extend their lives or spiritual seekers of various kinds why is that why is it kept out of their conversation revelations 21 4 says there will be no more death and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever John 3:16. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord notice here I am specifically talking about eternal life in the world as a human being flesh and blood that men shall see that eternal life for there is another which is an ascension up to the real heaven in which there is also eternal life however I believe ultimately they will all cycle back and be reborn into the world because the scripture tells us that the world is the dwelling place of God previously up in the heavens was the dwelling place or is the dwelling place currently of the Father but we know that the Son is the Father the Son is the rebirth of the Father and he will ultimately reside in the earth as a man and that will be the eternal life of God so what does God say about eternal life in the world Revelation 21 4 there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away no more sorrow is the most impressive of these promises consider that as a human being in order to not experience sorrow you would actually have to either not be someone that could experience sorrow in other words no matter what you see you would always be happy or you would never witness anything that could even cause sorrow like the tragedy of others even if it's not happening to you that could still cause sorrow either way it says no sorrow and when God says something he means it because we know that God is as good as his word because 
The parameters of his word combined with the overall reality tell us that we cannot come up to God later and point out that one of the things that he said actually wasn't true. So we know it has to be true. There will be no more sorrow. Pain is a little more understandable because you could turn the body's sensors off to pain so even if you get mangled in a car wreck, you know, you may not feel it so that's impressive. But even that would cause sorrow. So even if you didn't feel physical pain. So no sorrow is quite amazing. And once again, I don't think it's any time in the next thousand years because there will st the scripture tells us that during the millennial reign of Christ, which is coming up, hasn't started yet. But during that time, even though it's considered the rest day, it is the seventh of the 7,000 year plan of God. So it's the day of rest, the same as Saturday, the seventh day of the week is now considered the day of rest. But during that time, there will still be elements such as serpents, that is lizard men eating people. So if that's going on, it means that sorrow is still going to be at some extent in the world. So just realize that this promise does not say it will be fulfilled immediately. Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who become God's friends will run and not get tired. This seems like a physical impossibility, yet there it is in his word. Think about the jealous fury of those who would not listen to God's word when they see the prowess of those people that did listen to God's word and they see that these people can run and not get tired. Does this mean they will not sleep? In any case, you can imagine how much better these people will feel when they've received that life from God, that life that's coming in the world. They will certainly have more energy than average people. They will be like supermen. Song of Solomon 2.8 Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Notice, this is talking about Jesus, but it indicates that superhuman powers may be available. It could be that the makers of Superman were seeing a vision of what was to come in the world. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thine hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. Now again, this is talking about the Lord. However, it indicates that superpowers may be available to the friends of God, and I think likely will be. Now it may be that such superpowers are confined to God, but if you think about the other parameters that we know apply to everyone, there will be no more pain or sorrow or getting tired. That in itself would make them supermen. Probably also those who enter into life would be stronger than the naturally born man and they would also be smarter and have better memory retention. Also it is likely that they would have things like psychic abilities which people now do not have. Now we've seen some about the abilities that those who will get the real human 2.0 will receive. But what about appearance? We all look back from age and think about the vigor of our youth and lament that it was so much better back then. But listen to this. Psalm 110.3 Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now this is really interesting. The part I'm talking about here is the, the dew of youth. That means this is actually talking to the Son of God. This is saying that he will have his youth. Well, I think that's clearly saying that all of those who receive life will get 
their perfect youth. But it's also interesting here, if you'll notice that it says, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Key phrase, womb of the morning. That's probably talking about the spirit because the spirit is the maker of people. Notice that garment in the scripture is a fitting code word for the body. Isaiah 61, 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, this scripture is packed with meaning. This is speaking to the elect, the saved remnant of the Jews, for it says those in Zion, which refers to Israel and Judah, the two main houses of the Jews. However, the scripture tells us there are a multitude of all kindreds in the earth that are saved into the kingdom. Thus, the parameters of change, the sorrow to joy, the ashes to beauty, the heaviness of spirit to the body of praise should apply to all who overcome. Now, there's a whole interesting topic on the spirit of heaviness, which the late and great deliverance minister, Derek Prince, spoke of when he said that he was wondering where he got his depression, and then he was reading in the scripture, and he found it in that verse that I just read, the spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise. So, for whatever reason, God is telling us that the new body, the new perfect body that we're going to get from the hand, the spirit, or womb of the morning, is going to be in some way a, a replacement for that spirit of heaviness because it's like the opposite. When you have a body that's truly so beautiful that people praise you for it, that in itself makes you happy. So God is telling us that he's going to trade our spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise. And speaking exactly of that garment of praise, that body of praise, Psalm 45 tells us that it will be more comely than the naturally born man. For it says concerning God once again, but we can associate that it means for everyone who enters the kingdom, that they will be fairer than the children of men. This in itself is an amazing reality that's revealed. That the people of God, as they appear on the earth, will be noticeably better looking than the naturally born people. So we've seen something about the attributes and the appearance that you'll receive if you make a friend of God, if you overcome, if you play by God's rules. You know what they are, the rules? Yeah, everyone's heard of the Ten Commandments. So now, what about the spiritual or moral characteristics that you're going to get with the real Human 2.0? Here's a great one to start out with. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Friends, I don't know about you, but offenses seem to me like one of the main problems people have. Here, this gem of a thing in God's Word telling us that nothing shall offend those that enter life. Those that have found me, wisdom, have found life, eternal life. When you enter into that, which is coming. Men are going to see it. It's coming. It's going to be a real thing. It's going to blow people away. It's going to be like, whoa, it's going to be a new thing. People are going to see it. People are going to know it. Because you're going to get these people that are starting to live past 100 and they look like they're teenagers. But here, this is truly great. <laughs> I mean, nothing shall offend them. Okay? Those that love the law of the Lord. 
which is everyone who will enter life. That means you pay attention to what God's Word is saying. You are studying it. You are reading it on a daily basis. You are meditating on it constantly. And you love the Lord because you see that His words are pure and that His promise is good. And you live in faith that you're going to get that better thing, even though it is also written that no man has understood what God has in store for those who wait for Him. So even though we know all these parameters, we still don't understand the full scope of what God has in store. Imagine never being offended anymore. Imagine not being afraid you'll be offended anymore. How much different you will feel. Now we all have experience with seeing our personal flaws. Who knows what it could be? Impatience, getting too angry at things, selfishness. Who knows what all flaws we have. But I found something rather interesting in the scripture which to me is one of the greatest things in there. It's in Psalm 45, 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Notice it doesn't say perfect of character or no personality flaws or even all perfect within, but it says all glorious within. Thus, God is associating glory with being perfect of personality. And who does not want personal glory? It is important to contrast that with what we have now. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? If a man understands that with God he can be all glorious without and all glorious within, he can then accept his current condition because he has hope that he really can be something else. He really can be something more. And God tells us very clearly what that is. Perfect eternal life. Perfect of body and perfect of soul. And if he understands this reality in the teaching of God, even now he can make strides to improve himself. The scripture teaches that there is a difference between the man with hope and the man without hope. That is, the hope for eternal life. It changes the perspective of a man, and it changes it for the better if he has hope. His attitude is going to be better because he knows that he's getting something from God that is much better than the life that we see before us. Now, the expectation of hope that I am speaking of is not for that he might give more perfect praise to God and is not for that he might receive the golden mansion in heaven. But the kind of hope I'm talking about is the hope of the perfection of life in the world as a man, his personal glory as a man. And the men that I have liked in this life are aware of this and don't say that they don't have an ego or that they do not seek or desire personal glory. As I have taught, the beginning of heaven and the earth will introduce a new state of reality much different from what we experience now. And this will be coming with the never-ending kingdom of God in the earth. The kingdom of God in the earth starts with the people of God entering into the perfection, the eternal life, the flesh, the soul, that is, born of the Spirit, perfected. This is what Jesus meant when he said you must be born again or born of the Spirit. Because there is a different explanation of the born again which Paul was referring to as being born again of the Spirit. Now, this is not to say that he was wrong 
once again, as I have taught, this was a different interpretation or a different use of the phrase, you must be born again or born of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. Because Paul was talking about in, in the early church that we needed to be renewed of spirit through the gift of the Holy Ghost by the faith of Jesus Christ. But what Jesus, I believe, was originally talking about, the being born again, is that perfection, that moment of perfection, that moment of entering into the new body that is not the body of this death, that is not the no good thing dwelling within, but the all glorious within, the garment of praise. Okay? Now, this is the change that we've been waiting for. This is real. Friends, this is not a science fiction that you're watching here. This is not a pie-in-the-sky spiritual element, at least as far as what I am telling you here, because what I am saying is that if this doesn't come true in our face, that I, Richard, was wrong and bear the shame of that being wrong and telling everybody a wrong thing. So it's either going to happen and I'm right, or it's not going to happen and I'm wrong. So obviously I am saying that this is not an intangible fairy tale story that maybe somebody will maybe find out about it, but there's no proof. Blah, blah. I'm talking about proof in your face. No one doubts it. It's real. And everyone's going to know it. Now, the scripture also tells us that in due time, not right away, like I said, during the next thousand years, but eventually... The scripture tells us everyone will walk in the name of his God. That's going to be upon the earth. So this will be knowledge that everyone will have very clearly because they'll all be of this perfected state. And Satan and the beasts, by the way, don't want you to know this information. They, they want to, the, and their human allies, so not just the beast, but also their human allies that know that they can't be redeemed because they continue to do wickedness and evil, and they won't come to God, and they won't repent. God has control over all these plagues, over all this, over death, everything, and yet they won't repent of their lies, their fornication, their adultery, their stealing, their killing people, their hurting people. They won't stop doing that. They won't stop oppressing the poor. Nope, they won't stop doing that. But you can. If you're currently doing that and you're watching, you can. At any time, you can repent. God says that he will accept anyone, no matter what sin you've done. He will forgive it if you will only come to him, stop doing the sin, have faith in his son, and do the Ten Commandments. Everyone's heard of the Ten Commandments, and it's not that hard. There's only two things to do and eight things you're not supposed to do. And basically it boils down to what Jesus said it boils down to. Treat others like you would treat yourself. All right, so now, is there a reading in the Scripture of when this is going to happen? Now, we know that no man knows the date or the time. Not even the Son of God knows, only the Father. The scripture tells us, but... Is there an indication of when this will occur in terms of other events? Well, I believe this is listed in the scripture. In Isaiah 66, 14, it says, And when you see this, that is, Jerusalem, or the Queen of the Jews, taking her people under her wing, okay? So this means uh, she's probably going to have her powers and and the wealth of the Gentiles is going to be turned in unto her. And so she's going to have the capability to start taking her people under her wing. So when it says here in Isaiah 66, 14, and when you see this, that's what it means. So when you see Jerusalem starting to take her people under her wing, then we know that this is going to be the moment that people start to enter into the new flesh. Now it should be understood that as this becomes known in the world, that people are receiving that eternal glory. I don't think that will come right away. It probably could even be hundreds of years before people actually find out and it becomes known worldwide. 
And who knows, for God's purpose, he may keep that under wraps so that most people don't figure it out. But my guess is that people will know, and it's right there in the scripture. And these people are probably going, I don't see why they would keep it a secret unless God tells them to. So this is going to be known, that, you know, because they themselves who have received it will talk about it. They're not aging, and people see that. And as the scripture says, Psalm 45, 2, Thou art fairer than the children of men. So that means more beautiful than the naturally born man. People are going to see it with their eyes, so that's going to be right in your face. And when this happens, understand that this glory of the people of God is going to be over and against the glory of the people in the world. Because there's still going to be young men and women and people doing things, making movies and, you know, enjoying life and want to have glory themselves. But the glory of those that receive eternal life with God because they have shown God that they're worthy through the faith and the life of Jesus Christ, they are going to have glory that's going to very much outshine that of anybody else who is not of it. And even just side by side, it may be a unfriendly comparison to someone of lesser glory, someone who doesn't have that exclusivity of that entering into the reward that God has promised in his word that was right there in a Bible on every street corner that was available to anyone if they wanted to come to God and just only stop doing the evil of the world, which God will reveal to you what that is once you are ingrained into the life of sanctifying yourself before God, giving ear to God's word daily, praying, seeking God daily, and putting up with, yes, the oppression and the attack of the enemy. Because once you start being a friend of God, you become an enemy of the world. Specifically, an enemy of a giant man-eating reptile known as Satan, who eats human souls. And his children eat human souls and flesh. And so, they're not exactly happy about you not becoming food for them. Okay? so. That's the, that's the real story. That's why they hate you so bad. And they hate you because you're succeeding. You're going to be a friend of God because they all know that God is in control of this whole thing. He's the real boss. Satan is the current governor. But he's the real boss who really controls everything and intercedes. Okay, Because Satan wants to bring everyone into his fold. He still, he still has hope in his life, even though he knows ultimately he and all of his followers will be thrown into the lake of fire. They know that. But even so, they have hope in this current life, this current reality. And so they, they try desperately to recruit people and get them in. He'll even try to get the elect to follow him if, if at all possible. They, they try and they try and they try. But they're not going to succeed. And in the end, there will be a reckoning. There will be a showing of who is who and who did what. So with this difference of the eternal people of God and with the people of the world that live in Satan's spirit, or that did, because Satan will be subdued. Who knows, they may still possess Satan's spirit. But in any case, there's going to be like an explosion of powers that will manifest into the natural. And these people are going to realize that it's a war, essentially, because it culminates ultimately in the Battle of Armageddon. So the people of the nations who hate and resent the people of God, who have received the gift of God and have eternal life, and are more comely than the regular man that is born into the world, they are going to come and attempt to destroy the city, which is the source of God's people, Jerusalem. They're talking about the city, Jerusalem, not the person, Jerusalem. And they're going to attempt to burn the city and the people but God will send fire from heaven down upon them and burn them up, as the scripture tells us. So we do not know exactly when or even the order of events which will surround the time that the people of God begin to be delivered into that eternal life for their faith in Jesus and doing the Ten Commandments. But eventually it will come and people will see it. Who is watching? 
who is aware? Who knows the voice of the shepherd? And who answers when he calls? So we see clearly in God's word, the real human 2.0. So in summary, there will be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain. There will be a renewed strength, a returning to youth, running and not tiring, and that probably means not tiring from other things as well, and being superior in appearance to the natural man, being free of personality defects, okay? They will be children who do not lie, neither do they sin. This is huge. And they will not be offended. Furthermore, even with all this information, we know that actually we do not have a comprehension of what this reward from God to the faithful is going to be. And we can see that here in Isaiah 64, 4. Since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. But what does trust really mean? What does waiting really mean? It means doing the Ten Commandments in the faith of Jesus. Now, how do you get it? You want the things that I just talked about? You can get it. Anyone can choose to come to God. You start by saying a prayer. God will hear you. He'll know if you've decided to come to Him. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. He will hear, He will know, if you've decided to come to Him. Say a prayer like this. Father in heaven, please save my soul by the work of your Son Jesus on the cross, and show me your pure words in the authorized King James Bible. If you say this prayer, you can count on the fact that God is going to come into your life and show you amazing things. You have to be patient. You may have to wait 30 years like I did before you encounter your first miracle as I did with angels in 2019. But wait and it will come. There's no doubt that if you come to God, God will come to you. He's waiting in this situation. This whole thing is designed to see if you're going to, at some point, usually almost, I would say exclusively, in a difficult moment where you're asking yourself, what is all this? What, what can I do? Is there some way out? Is there something more? And then God will show you his words. He'll start to reveal as you repent. That is, come away, because we're all born in sin and we're all born into a situation of doing sin. So it's learning how to come away from the world. 